We live in a society in which there's tremendous inequality, and some groups have more political, social, and economic power than other groups. And what I've done is I've drawn a chart of some of the ways in this society some groups have more social, political, and economic power and others don't. And by that I mean that if we look at who makes decisions about our daily lives, where jobs are located, where toxic waste is dumped, who goes to jail and who gets an education, that we're going to more likely see people from, from categories on this side of the chart. And that means that they're going to make decisions in general which benefit people on this side of the chart. Now, if you have less power, it means you have less power to protect yourself. If you have less power to protect yourself, it means you're vulnerable to violence. So we're also talking about how people on this side of the chart are vulnerable to violence simply from being part of a group. But of course, we don't hold people on this side responsible for that violence, do we? What we do is we blame people on this side of the chart for the violence that happens to them. How do we blame women? What things do we say or ask about women to hold them responsible for the violence they experience? Why didn't she leave? Why didn't she leave? What did, you, how, what did you do to cause it? How did you provoke him? Just do what he says. And what was she wearing? And why was she out at that time? And so all of these questions focus our attention over here and hold her responsible. They, we don't, the question we're not asking is, why did he hit her and what are we going to do about it? And that's the question we really need to ask, right? Those two questions. So we could go up and get down this chart again and look at each of these groups and how they are blamed and scapegoated for the violence that people on this side of the chart are doing to them. So there's the direct violence, there's the blaming and scapegoating, and then the third level is that if you grow up all of your life hearing that you're to blame, you begin to believe it a little bit. We start saying, well, maybe I'm not smart enough, or maybe I don't work hard enough, or maybe I shouldn't have trusted him. We begin to internalize those messages. So the third, le third level that this works on is the internalization of this whole process. Some categories change over a lifetime, and, and many don't, right? We all start over here, we get some basic training in what it means to be vulnerable to, to violence, some basic training in living in a society of dominance and hierarchy. We all get over here and we're promised at least one group that we can pass on our pain and anger towards, right? Wait till you're an adult and you, and you can take out your pain and anger on, on other people. It makes a big difference how much we're on one side or the other. The more I'm on this side, the more cumulatively I benefit from the whole system. The more I'm on this side, the more cumulatively I'm vulnerable to violence. So it makes a big difference how much we're on either side. It's not just, you know, 50-50. Um, the message of this system is that whatever pain and anger and frustration you have, to find somebody who's less powerful and pass it on to. So to use kind of a classic example, if I'm a worker, I can take it out on my kids. If I'm a man, I can take it out on the women around me. If I'm Pahaya, I can take it out on, or I can blame people of color for my problems. If I'm a citizen, I can blame recent immigrants. Get over here and pass it on. And it creates a cycle of violence. This is the context of violence that we live in. This is what the training's for, the socialization. Um, I'm going to come back to this in a minute, but I think that one of the things to notice is that adult men are trained to be right up here on this side of the chart, to expect to be in control. What are the messages that young boys receive about what does it mean to be a man? Be tough, be aggressive, be in control, be successful. That is training to be right up here on this side of the chart and to expect to be making decisions about other people's lives. And it's also directly training to expect women to be available sexually, psychologically, emotionally to take care of us. Now, of course, as men, we're not only right up here, but we're all over the place, right? So that's not a, a simple kind of expectation because many of us are working class or poor or men of color or gay or we have disabilities or whatever. And so there's, 
there's a lot of conflict there. We have to figure out how we can do that. We tend to notice the, the lines where we're on a less powerful side because that's survival for us. We're vulnerable over here. Over here, we're in the culture of power. We're mainstream, we, so we don't necessarily notice that. So, for instance, as a Jewish person, I'm very sensitive to anti-Semitism. I need to be because that's survival for me. But I'm also able-bodied, right? I don't have to think about that every day. When I you know, was invited to the conference and, and made the arrangements and everything, I didn't have to ask if this room was wheelchair accessible, did I? Because I knew I could just walk in. How many of you thought to ask if the facilities here were accessible? That's what it means to be in the culture of power, is that we don't have to think about the issues every day. As a, uh, as a woman, those of you who are women here know that you always have to pay attention to sexism and your physical safety. And that the gender is always on the table some way or another. When you walk into a room, when you're talking to people, when you're going down the street, whatever. As a man, I don't have to pay attention to that most of the time. That's what it means to be on this side of the chart. The system naturally just, the benefits come to me. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. Um, we have to look at what, what keeps this going, you know, who benefits from this system. So I want to just spend a couple minutes looking at the economic system, which I think is an underpinning of this whole thing, and then I'm going to spend the last uh, good chunk of time looking at what does that mean about men and what men can do and what men have done and things like that. So we're going to bring it much more back specifically in a minute. But there's a missing piece here because we have to look at the economic system to be able to make sense of a lot of the dynamics in men's lives because work and jobs and money is crucial. And we live in a system in which if this is a pyramid that represents the population and the wealth of New Zealand, and I'm gonna use some simple figures here, um, that if I draw a line up here representing 10% of the population, it controls greater than 50% of the wealth of the country. And that's all of the wealth, the land, the buildings, the stocks and bonds, the cars, the houses, all of that stuff. I'm gonna draw a line somewhere about here, representing 50% of the population down here who is dividing up less than 3% of the wealth of New Zealand. And in fact, there's a whole lot of people at below the bottom of this who have, there's almost 16 or 70% of people who have uh, in debt, they have no worth at all financially. Well, this is part of, the, the people at the top of the pyramid benefit from the fact that we are all caught up in this cycle of violence. Because as long as we are hitting and abusing and exploiting each other and blaming each other for our problems, we're not paying any attention to the people at the top of the pyramid. And one of the ways that this works for men in particular is that it's really easy for men to take out whatever pain and anger and frustration there is in their, around their work and, and economic opportunities to the people around us who are closest to us. Now that doesn't mean that men at the top of the pyramid are not violent, because we know that men are. But they also have a lot of other ways that are not physically violent to be in control. And the key issue for men is control, it's not violence. I was taught it was not good to hit a woman. You know, you should avoid that as much as you could. It was better to control her by emotional means, verbal means, financial means, you know. It was better to be in control than to have to actually exert control. But I was also told, bottom line, you have to be in control. And if you have to hit her, that's not so great, but it's not so bad. It's not as bad as not being in control. So there's a lot of difference between who has various tools of control. Um, and the scarcity of resources, if you think about it, 50% doesn't divide into 3% very well, does it? Um, so this is part of the discussion we need to have with men about what's going on in their lives and what kind of choices they make. 